Bestiary by Juan José Arriola. Juan José Arreola is one of the greatest Latin American writers of the 20th century, so he's at the beginnings of a distinguished line of writers that would end up with Gabriel García Márquez, Alejo Carpentier, Jorge Luis Borges, for example. Arreola used the brilliant elements of fantasy to underscore the ever-present absurdist ideas in his work. And I promise you, as a Mexican myself, it takes a lot to be master of the imagination and absurdist ideas in a country as beautifully mad and creatively absurd as my beloved Mexico is. I know what I'm talking about here. In the introduction to his admirable translation of Arreola's work for the University of Texas Press, Professor George D. Shade does a fantastic job of introducing Juan José Arreola and Bestiary, his catalogue of beasts, which is what we'll be reading today, to us. So let's listen to Professor Shade. In an age when many writers take themselves so seriously as to be solemn, it is refreshing to come across an author like Arreola, who laughs gleefully and wickedly at man, and by implication at himself, puncturing all the foolishness he indulges in and cutting through the glaze of manners society sets so much store by. Arreola is an accomplished satirist, He is very good at finding chinks in the armor, attacking his subjects in the most vulnerable spots, and sometimes in places where they probably did not realize they were vulnerable. Bourgeois society and all its false values, rampaging 20th century materialism, the bomb, the cocktail party, are just a few of his targets. With mordant descriptions, pungent attacks, or sly irony, he shows how silly mankind is, how outrageous man's behavior and antics are, how one is at the mercy of a world and society that more often seems to care for what is trivial and ephemeral than for what is essential. Arreola jabs at complacency and ruthlessly exposes pompous and hypocritical attitudes. He takes a depressing view of most human relationships, and in a large number of his stories and satires, he chips away at love and its illusions. Whatever the subject of his satire, Arreola most often achieves his effects by a deliberate jumbling of fantasy and reality, a mingling of the logical and the absurd, a blend of imaginative frivolity and Orwellian grimness. One of the most ingratiating and delightful parts of Arreola's collector works is his bestiary, consisting of 26 brief sketches. Here Arreola harkens back to that form, which was so fashionable in medieval times with moralists and allegorizers, where certain virtues or characteristics were popularly attributed to certain beasts, real or imaginary. All of Arreola's beasts are real, their human-like foibles and defects uncomfortably real, too. Though Arreola's general outlook and some of the details in his bestiary will probably horrify the overly sentimental, still there are lyrical and poetic touches to offset, to some degree, the refined savagery of his attire. Endowed with a resilient mind that skims swiftly from point to point, Arreola is also a gifted stylist. His imagery and language are tart and fresh. His choice of words sometimes startling the reader, at other times stinging him, frequently delighting him. His writing is crisp with sentences that tend to be short and closely packed, yet there is no jerky or jolting effect. It is all perfectly under control, balanced and rhythmic. 
anyone whose ear has become somewhat dulled by the monotone of much present-day literature will probably be charmed by the banquet in store for him in word and image in Arreola's prose. That was Professor Shade from the University of Texas. Let us then listen now to Juan José Arreola's bestiary, Catalog of Beasts. Prologue Love thy worthless and deserving neighbor. Love thy neighbor who stinks, who is spotted with filth, who wears his poverty on his back. Greet most heartily the grotesque fellow in sloppy pants, who, in the name of humanity, gives you his trembling, jelly-like credential, the dead fish hand, all the while giving you the one sober with his big dog eyes. Love thy neighbor, that pig, that rooster, who trots merrily along to his crude paradise, animal possession. And love thy fellow woman, too, who at thy side is suddenly transformed into somebody else, someone who in her cow-like pajamas interminably chews on the doughy cod of domestic routine. The Rhinoceros The Rhinoceros comes to a halt. He raises his head. He backs up a bit. Then he wills in a circle and fires his artillery piece. Furious and blind, a battering rum, he charges like an armored bull with a lone horn with the single-minded vigor of a materialistic philosopher. He never hits the target, but he remains perpetually pleased with his strength. Then he opens his escape valves and snorts full steam. During the mating season, the bull rhinoceroses repair to clearings in the forest. There, laden with excessive armor, they abandon themselves to the graceless, lumbering joust in which only the medieval clangor of the collision counts. Now in captivity, the rhinoceros is a melancholy, rusty beast. His multi-plated body was armed during prehistoric landslides with laminations of coarse hide and stumped under the pressure of geological strata. But at a special moment during the morning, the rhinoceros startles us. From his dry, gaunt flanks, like water from the rocky cleft, springs the great organ of torrential and potent life. It repeats the horn motif of the beast's head, with variations of the orchid, the javelin, and the shield. Let us pay homage, then, to the tough, abstruse creature, for he has given rise to a beautiful legend. Incredible though it may seem, this primordial athlete is the spiritual father of the poetic creature that is unfurled in tapestries of the lady, the chivalrous, gallant unicorn. Conquered by the prudent maiden, the carnal rhinoceros, transfigured, becomes deer-like, gazelle-like, and kneels. And the obtuse horn of masculine aggression changes in the presence of the virgin to a svelte ivory lament. The Owl before devouring his victims, the owl digests them mentally. He never takes a whole mouse under consideration without previously forming some idea of each one of its parts. The actuality of the throbbing victuals in his talons takes on a past concept in his mind and is a prelude to the analytical operation of a slow intestinal process. 
Here is a case of profound reflective assimilation. With his sharply penetrating claws, the owl directly apprehends his object and develops his peculiar theory of knowledge. The thing in itself, rodent, reptile, or flying creature, surrenders to him in some unfathomable way. Perhaps through the invisible claw swipe of an instantaneous intuition, perhaps thanks to a logical period of waiting, since we always imagine the owl as stationary, introverted, and not much given to the predatory passions of chase and capture. Who can say for sure that shadowy labyrinths, dark syllogisms that lead to nothingness after the brief claws of the beak are not awaiting suitable creatures? To understand the owl is equivalent to accepting this premise. Harmonious pillar of carved feathers perched on a Greek metaphor. Sinister, shadowy clock striking in the spirit an hour of medieval witchcraft. This is the two-faced image of the bird that flies at dusk and is the best vignette of books of Western philosophy. The bear. Between the open hostility of the wolf, for example, and the submission of the monkey, who is capable of sitting down with the family to breakfast at our table, stands the cordial moderation of the bear, who dances and rides a bicycle, but who can go too far and crush us in his embrace. It is always possible to strike up a friendship with him at a distance, if we don't have a honeycomb in our hand. Like his weaving head, the bear's soul weaves between slavery and rebellion. His pelt indicates his temperament, If white, bloodthirsty. If black, good-natured. Fortunately, the bear displays his different states of mind with all the nuances of grays and browns. Whoever has met a bear in the forest knows that as soon as he sees us, he stands up with a gesture of recognition and greeting. The rest of the interview depends exclusively on us. If women are involved, there is nothing to fear since the bear has for them an age-old respect which clearly betrays his kinship with primitive man. However adult and athletic bears may be, they still have something babyish about them. No woman would refuse to give birth to a little bear cub. In any case, maidens always keep a furry teddy bear in their bedrooms as a good omen of maternity. Let us confess we have a common cave past with them. The cave bear yields the most abundant of fossils, and its distribution accompanies all prehistoric human migrations. In our day, the bear den continues to be the most comfortable of wild lairs. Latins and Teutons agreed in honoring the bear with a cult, baptizing with derivations of its name, Ursus and Bera, an extensive series of saints, heroes, and cities. The Elephant The elephant comes from way back in time and is the last earthly model of heavy machinery. Wrapped in its canvas sheath, it seems colossal, because it is constructed with pure living cells and endowed with intelligence and memory. Inside the material accumulation of its body, its five senses function like precision instruments. Nothing escapes them. Though because of pure hereditary old age, the elephant is now bald at birth, frozen Siberia has given us some woolly examples. How many years ago did the elephant lose its hair? Instead of trying to figure it out, let's all go to the circus and pretend we are grandchildren of the elephant, that childish grandfather who now sways to the rhythm of a polka. Uh, No, Uh, let's talk instead about ivory, that noble substance, hard and uniform, which pachyderms secretly push with all their body's might like a material expression of thought. 
The ivory, which protrudes from the head and develops in the vacuum two curved, bright stalactites, on which the Chinese, with patient fantasy, have carved all the elephant's formal dreams. The Camel Family The llama's hair is impalpably soft, but its tenuous locks are chiseled by the harsh wind of the mountains where it struts about arrogantly, lifting high its svelte neck so its eyes will be filled with distance and its fine nose absorb at an even higher level the supreme distillation of rarefied air. At hot sea level, the camel seems as small as Bestos Gondola, with his four feet slowly rowing through the waves of sand while the desert wind pummels the massive sails of its humps. For the thirsty, the camel guards in its rocky insides the last trickle of humidity. For the solitary, the plushy, curving, feminine llama assumes the movements and grace of an illusory woman. The Giraffe When God realized he had placed the fruits of a favorite tree too high, he could do nothing but make the giraffe's neck longer. Quadrupeds with their heads in the air, the giraffes try to go beyond their corporal reality and resolutely enter the reign of excessive proportions. Problems that seemed to be more engineering and mechanical than biological had to be resolved for them. A nervous system 12 meters long, blood rising against the law of gravity by means of a heart functioning like a deep well pump. And at such heights, a retractile tongue extending still higher, exceeding by 20 centimeters where the lips can reach to rasp at tree buds like a steel file. With all this technical extravagance, which extraordinarily complicates its gallop and love making, the giraffe embodies better than any other creature the madness of the spirit. It seeks in heights what others find right on the ground. But since now and then it must bend over to drink the common water, it is obliged to unwind its acrobatics in reverse. Then it is down on the burros level. The Hippopotamus Pensioned off by nature and bereft of a swamp his size, the hippopotamus sinks into boredom. Biological potentate, he no longer keeps company with the bird, the flower, and the gazelle. Enormously bored, wrapped up in his colossal cloak, he slumbers at the edge of his puddle like a drunk near his empty glass. A pneumatic ox, he dreams that he grazes once again in the submerged meadows of some backwater, or that his stones float placidly among snowy water lilies. From time to time, he twitches and snorts, then falls back into the catatonia of his stupor. If he yawns, his malformed mandibles seem to yearn after, to engulf vast stretches of time gone by. What is to become of the hippopotamus if he may now serve only as a dredger, a bulldozer of swampy terrain, a paperweight of history? With that great mass of primordial clay, one feels like modeling a cloud of birds, an army of mice deployed through the forest, or two or three medium-sized domestic acceptable beasts. But no, the hippopotamus persists just as he is, and so reproduces himself. Beside the hypnotic tenderness of the female reposes the pink and monstrous baby. 
Let us speak of the hippopotamus's tail, amiable, almost smiling item that offers itself to us as the only possible thing to seize onto. Short, thick, smooth, it hangs like a door knocker, like the clapper to the vast bell of his body. It is adorned with a fine fringe of hair along the sides, like a sumptuous tassel between the double curtain of his round, majestic buttocks. Monkeys Wolfgang Köhler wasted five years in Tetuan trying to make a chimpanzee think. Like a good German, he planned a series of mental tricks, obliging the monkey to find his way out of complicated labyrinths and attain difficult tidbits by using ladders, doors, perches and canes. After such training, Momo became the most intelligent simian in the world. But faithful to his species, he took advantage of all the psychologist's moments of inattention and obtained his rations without crossing the threshold of conscience. He was offered his freedom, but he preferred to stay in his cage. Now many millennia before, how many, monkeys decided their fate. They did not give in to the temptation to become men. They did not fall into the rational design, and they are still in paradise, caricaturesque, obscene, and free in their manner. Now we look at them in the zoo as at a depressing mirror. They look at us with sarcasm and uneasiness because we keep on watching their animal conduct. Bound to an invisible dependence, we dance to the music played for us like the organ grinder's monkey. We seek unsuccessfully a way out of the labyrinths into which we fall, and our minds fail to capture unattainable metaphysical fruits. The extended interview between Momo and Wolfgang Köhler has cancelled forever all hope of understanding between the primates and ended in another melancholy farewell smacking of failure. Homo sapiens went to a German university to edit the celebrated treatise on the intelligence of the anthropoids which gave him fame and fortune while Momo stayed on in Tetuan, enjoying a life pension of fruits within hand's reach. We have just read eight of the 26 fragments that make up Juan José Arreola's charming bestiary, or catalogue of beasts. And now let me share with you a fantastic revelation made by another great writer, José Emilio Pacheco, one of Arreola's most famous disciples. Believe it or not, these are all spontaneous fables that Arreola dictated to him in the course of a very stressful week. It turns out that the deadline for submitting a manuscript was about to end, and the publisher had threatened to sue Arreola if he did not deliver the promised document or return the money they had paid him as an advance. But Arreola was in dire straits, and this was the money with which he and his family had barely survived for the last few months. So, as a good disciple and friend, José Emilio Pacheco arrived at 9 a.m. on December the 8th, 1958, at Arreola's house to play the role of scribe while Arreola dictated everything we just heard as if he were reading an invisible text, says Pacheco. Why not let José Emilio Pacheco, who wrote prose and poetry masterpieces that we should also bring to this table, tell us how it all happened? Contrary to popular wisdom, writer's block is not the inability to write something, but of sitting down to do it. The final deadline expired on December 15, 1958. If Arreola did not deliver the manuscript, the publishing house, through its lawyers, would force Arreola to return the advance. So it was that on December the 8th, Already with the water up to our necks, I showed up 
at nine in the morning, and had Arreola throw himself on his folding bed, while I sat down at the pine table and took out paper, pen, and inkwell, and said, There's no choice. Now you do it or you do it. Arreola lay on his back on the folding bed, covered his eyes with a pillow, and asked me, Where do I start? I said the first thing that occurred to me, with the zebra. Then, as if reading an invisible text, the bestiary began to flow from his lips, and on December 14, I heard the end of the book. Finishes Pacheco. The editor in turn received the manuscript on the appointed day, which was the next day. This remarkable ability to work under appalling pressure and still produce such quality art reminds me of the equally meteoric and brilliant Joaquino Rossini, whose beautiful music will grace this podcast someday soon. But today, the allegorical zoo and the life of Juan José Arriola have presented us with several allegorically and beastly radiant whispers. Thanks for listening. You know the drill. If you liked it, be a mighty rhinoceros or a gallant unicorn and use your svelte ivory lament to press the like key, to leave me a comment, to subscribe, and share this with all the gallant rhinos and mighty unicorns, male or female, that you know. <laughs> <laughs>